So first of all, well, I'm really happy to be back here today. Um, normally, I'm supposed to work at an office in Toronto, so anytime I'm not in Toronto is a great day, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, so what we want to do uh, is talk a little bit about the grain business. Um, particularly, I want to talk about the supply of grain, how much we actually produced in North America and in the world this past year. And then, of course, we need to talk about who's using it and how fast it's being used up and then see if we can draw some conclusions out of that as to how we're going to market this crop going forward. Now, um, if you have any questions as I'm going, just yell them out, okay? Uh, first of all, because I may get... If I don't explain something clearly enough, then that's kind of a shame. And the second thing is, if you put your hand up, if you're polite, I won't see you. I'm kind of a blind old bat, so... <laughs> You know, if you start speaking, that's good. If you have to throw a chair, then I know that's bad. Um, anyway, so I'm going to start off with a slide that has way too many numbers on it. But this is the last 20 years' worth of corn production in the United States. And there's really only a couple of things that we need to pay close attention to. But one of them is that we keep producing more corn. And we produce more corn in Ontario as well. But in the United States, we grew the record, or the Americans grew the record biggest corn crop in 2013. And then they broke that record in 2014. And then they broke the record again in 2015 and again in 2016. So over the course of four years, they set the record for the biggest corn production four years in a row. So each crop became successively bigger than the last one. Now, in 2017, we actually knocked it down a little bit, less acres. And you're starting to see the thing narrow back in. But production has grown from the drought in 2012, it's been a straight up shot. We're up to about 15 billion bushels of corn a year now, 15.1. The other thing, and probably more important, is that we're growing demand. And this is the good news piece of the corn market, guys, is that over the last four years, we've grown demand for corn by about 11%. And there aren't very many markets in the world that grow that fast. This is a breakdown of, um, of where corn demand is. So the green bars are... This is the portion of the crop that's used for feed. This is industrial, primarily ethanol. There's not much other than ethanol in the industrial corn market, some starch, some corn flour, that kind of stuff. These little purple bars at the bottom are corn exports. And this is really, really important. First of all, because we have growth, and second of all, because we have growth at home. In Ontario, the distribution of the crop is just about the same. Curiously enough, we grew the biggest corn crop in Ontario this year, two 0.1 million acres, average yield is 186 bushels per acre. So we have 9 million tons of corn uh, in Ontario this year. But like the Americans, feed demand here continues to grow. Um, one of the most important things about getting your demand out of feed and out of industrial users is that it's what I would call bricks and mortar demand at home, right? Has anybody here financed a new barn recently or priced one, right? It's not a get out quick thing, right? These are big long-term investments. And it's the same thing if you build an ethanol plant, you're gonna write a check for 200 or $250 million. When you're in, you're in. And the fact that export sales is dropping down isn't actually a bad thing because the guys who get the exports are the cheapest source in the world, right? And it's not necessarily stable demand. We might export a whole bunch of crop to Spain and then next year, the Ukraine has cheaper corn, and they get the Spanish business, and the stuff can drift on you a little bit. So this is a really good stable model and really good growth. The most important thing about the corn business is that demand continues to grow even though supplies have started to drop back. So for 2017 will be the first year in the last four or five where we're going to consume more corn than we grew. That's the bottom end of the price curve, right? Over the last couple of years, we have grown ending stocks because we've produced just a little bit more than we needed, just a little bit more than we needed, just a little bit. And so ending stocks went from a billion bushels to 2.3 billion bushels, and you start to build up this surplus in the marketplace. Come through the bottom part of the curve here now. Now, that doesn't mean stop selling grain, guys, because it takes about four years to go through. Maybe if you've got a lot of cash, you can stop, you know, but... But it does mean we've turned an important corner and we're, we're going to start to grind stocks down. Now, the big questions that are going to come up here in the next couple of weeks is how much corn is going to get planted in the spring of 2018 and what does the 18 crop look like? But we don't think it's going to be any bigger. We think demand's going to continue to grow. In terms of, so how do we price corn 
in a world where um, we've got big stocks, and although demand is keeping up, you know, we've built up a bit of inventory. And what I want to do is spend a little bit of time talking about how we forecast a market, right? Now, if you're going to forecast anything, the weather or some scientific process, the trick is to find situations that have been similar, right? So, for instance, we're in Bruce County today. If it's like below freezing and there's northwest winds coming across Lake Huron, what happens? Snows, right? And we know that because it's been doing it for as long as any of us can remember, right? So what we're looking for is years, this is stocks to use ratios on corn. And what we're doing is looking for years that have had similar sets of circumstances to the one we're in now, okay? So 2014, 2015, 2016, and 2017, we had roughly 20% carry out. We had crops that were in the 14 billion bushel range. We had similar circumstances, right? And so what we want to do is, whoa, I'm going to go past this one and come back to it. What we want to do is look at previous years and see what happens when we're in those types of circumstances. So this is the December corn futures for 2014, 2015, 2016, and 2017, okay? And it's from the 1st of January to the 31st of December in all of those years. And if you notice, every single one of those four years, the corn market does more or less the same thing, right? There's uh, several things about it that are similar. Every single time, the price of corn on the 1st of January is higher than it is. This is for new crops. So this is 2018. This is the corn that's in a bag right now. This is your seed corn. It's worth more today than it will be at the end of the year. That's the first thing you learn. The second thing is that every year we have a weather rally that happens sometime either in the end of June or very early July. Some of them like uh, 14 was pretty small, 15 was a great big one, 16 and 17 again, really big move. And the third thing that's common amongst all of those years is once you get past the point that the U.S. corn crop pollinates, once you get past the 1st of August, the show is over, right? That's where it just craps out and dies. So if there's anybody here whose normal corn marketing strategy is wait for that big rally at the end of the summer, keep waiting. <laughs> Maybe get a hammock. You know, could be a big wait. That's what happens. And the reason that it does the same thing every time is because the market pays for risk, right? If the crop isn't planted yet, we don't really know what might happen. And certainly when a crop is relatively small, so in the June-July period, if you get into some weather, that's when you can really beat up a crop. I think corn sets the number of rows in a cob when it's at six leaves. If there's any agronomist in the room, you can correct me on that. But you can beat a corn plant up pretty bad when it's knee high, and it costs you yield in the long run. So that's why the market reacts so radically to weather in June and the early parts of July, once the crop is pollinated, it's funny, if you farm as far north as you guys, or I'm from Simcoe County, so it's the same kind of thing. We never really think the corn crop's done till it black layers, right? Most of us spent September this year looking at the thermometer every morning going, did we make it, right? But in the U.S., in the U.S., where you know, they have more heat to work with, it's pollination. And once that stuff's pollinated, once the cob size is set, that's it. So after that point, the risk is off, and it's just a ride home. So if you want to have a marketing plan for corn, the first thing is what we know at this point about the crop year ahead is that we're probably going to have very close to the same number of acres as we had last year. Certainly we're grinding into ending stocks, but the shape of this thing is not going to be much different. We'll likely go, I hope we go higher in January. I've been hoping that a lot lately. I also hope I get a new pickup truck, but I don't know. The... You know, it's, we need a little bit of volatility here, but um, there's going to be a couple of opportunities. What sometimes we suggest, first of all, you should always have pricing orders in, but try and market a third of the corn crop sometime in the cold part of the winter, and that sort of flat plateau of decent pricing. I was suggesting to some guys that all you got to do is the first morning that the school buses are canceled, sell corn. We don't know exactly, I mean, if you farm in you know, Ohio, that might not work at all. Here, you'd sell it on, what was the first day of school? The sixth? Anyway, it was last week for sure. 
Anyways, and because that big rally in the summer, and that's your peak shot here, is really hard to find when you're in it, right? They come at different times and they last for a different amount of time. That is clearly the, the opportunity of the year. How many guys sold stuff right around the Canada Day long weekend this past year, right? Now, of the guys who did, are any of you sorry, right? That's that spike, that late June, early July spike. And you want to be in for that one. The last four years, every single one of those years, you, could have, you had an opportunity to contract new crop corn at 200 bucks, right, in that window. But it's a small one. And so moving some of the risk off before you get to that just makes the stress level a lot lower when you're trying to hit that sucker mid-flow. I'll back up to this other slide, just give you an idea. This is a, a basis map. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with these, but this is a map of North America, and, and the colors in the map are the corn bases. So those areas of the black and purple up there in, uh, in the Dakotas and Iowa, that is you know, where the corn basis is like 80 under, 70 and 80 under US. That's the cheapest corn basis. The blue at the bottom of Lake Michigan there, that's Chicago, so that's basically where you have a zero basis because that's where the futures are deliverable. And down there in the southeast, those look like a, looks like a hurricane actually on a weather map. Maybe I got the wrong map. No, no. Anyway, that, anybody's heard of Tyson and Smithfield and the big livestock integrators in the U.S. Southeast? So basically, corn flows from the high plains and turns into chicken poop in the Southeast. That's, that's how she works. We're, Eastern Ontario is actually the highest corn basis in North America. So if you look at the price of corn in Johnstown or... Um, Cardinal, sort of that Prescott, Eastern Ontario, ethanol and starch market, it's about 25 over US. So it would be in the orange on this map. Ontario, as you move further west, gets a little bit cheaper, but certainly basis is a big portion of the price in our marketplace, and it's, it's significant. Now, we'll go past that. Soybeans. So on to soybeans. The Americans did something really interesting last year. It was the first time in history they grew 90.4 million acres of soybeans. They grew 90 million acres of corn. It's the first time that the soybean crop was actually bigger than the corn crop in terms of acreage. And if the USDA is to be believed, their average yield was 49 bushels per acre. So it's a really big corn crop or soybean crop. In addition to that, South America grew more soybeans than North America did. And that's a big game changer because um, normally the you know South American production has been growing and growing, but the the fact that they've passed us is kind of significant. And so we have a, a world market now that clearly is the biggest soybean supply we've ever had. The good news is, just like corn, maybe not quite as fast as corn, but the good news is we're actually outrunning. Up until this year, we were actually outrunning demand. So this chart. The uh, dark blue lines is total U.S. soybean use, um, and the, the brown-orange line is production. So this is how many soybeans we grew, and this is how many soybeans we used. And what's really interesting is in 2015, we actually used more soybeans than we grew, and in 2013 and in 2012 and in 2011, we're actually outrunning demand, right? And so this, is, this 2016 crop is really the first one in a while where we built some stocks. And it doesn't matter how big the crop is. It could be a 100 million ton crop, and it could be a 200 million ton crop, and it doesn't matter. The only thing you need to worry about as a seller is the size of that gap and which side of it we're on. So the world's done a great job of gobbling up soybeans. Now, this chart, they changed colors between the U.S. chart and the world chart, so it kind of goofs us up. But the blue line is production and the brown line is use. And when you bring in that South American production, we've actually, that's, you know, 15 again, we were pretty much even. But this past year, we've, we've you know, created a bit of a surplus. So what does that do? Well, first of all, I'm going to talk about the good part of this, which is where all the darn soybeans go. This is Chinese usage of soybeans. And what's fun is if you go back to 1990, China actually exported soybeans. So the zero line there, they were actually shipping soybeans out about 3 million tons of soybeans a year left China going somewhere else. Somewhere around 2000, as 
you know, the Chinese market for soybeans grew, they started importing soybeans up to a point where in 2015, sorry, 2016, they imported about 85 million metric tons of soybeans. So basically, China bought as many soybeans as the Americans grew. If every soybean in the United States went to China, that's just about an offset. That is a crap pile of soybeans. Ontario grows 4 million tons, just to keep that in perspective for you. In the month of November 2017, so we don't have December's export figures yet, but in November 2017, China imported 8.7 million tons of soybeans. So if you did that 12 months in a row, that would put them over 100 million tons of soybeans coming into China in a year, in a calendar year. And that's good news because we really don't care who uses them as long as they're gone, right? Get them out of the marketplace. There is something I would keep a very close eye on if you're following the USDA reports, and that's that although China is importing soybeans right now at a record pace, they're the number of soybeans that they import from the United States, or the United States' export sales of soybeans is actually 11% below last year. So China is buying beans, but they're not buying American beans. You can, I'll leave that to your own interpretation rather than make this a dis political discussion, but the good news is they're using up beans. That's key. For Ontario, what we do, we produce 3 million acres of beans at 44 bushels. That's a 4 million ton crop. The two crushers in Ontario, in total, can use about 1.1 or 1.2 million tons of beans. So the biggest chunk of them get on boats and go to Northern Europe. We do not ship soybeans in any grand way to China from here because the bus ride is too far, right? You have to do a lap around the United States to get out of there. Ontario's soybeans, both the Roundup Ready ones and the non-GMO, not counting food beans, mostly go to Northern Europe. If you want a good talking point, the freight rate, if you load soybeans on a boat in, say, Hamilton and go to Rotterdam, is just a little bit less than 20 bucks a ton. Anybody own a truck? <laughs> like, half the cost of getting to the Netherlands is getting to the boat, right? It's really kind of cool. And it's important for us to know as Ontario farmers because the world is really, really, really small, right? and we're on the waterway. This is a basis map for soybeans, right? And I don't know if you slept in school the day they told you where the Mississippi River was, but that's what happens with soybeans in the United States. They get on a boat, or they get on a barge, they go down to New Orleans, they get on a boat, they go through the Panama Canal, they head across the Pacific. That's the trip. And this is an American map, uh, and I'm generally happy when the Americans ignore us, so the St. Lawrence River isn't there, but we're in the exact same situation here in Canada. The closer you get to the St. Lawrence River, we have an awesome export capacity in our marketplace, and we're actually um, quite a bit higher in terms of cash values than any place on our neighboring states. Soybeans in Ontario are worth 25 to 30 cents a bushel more than if they were in Ohio, right? Because we're through the Welland Canal locks and out and out into the salt water. So we're in a, in a good marketplace. In terms of um, executing on soybeans, you know, in terms of setting goals, price rations demand, right? And so this is a, a stocks to use to price chart. And the idea being that it's a fairly mathematical relationship. This green line would give you an idea of where prices should be based on stocks to use. So this is 1718's average price in the US at a little under 950 a bushel, probably about 925, and we think that this coming year's average price is going to be about 9 bucks. So about 25 cents a bushel US less than last year's average price. If you're doing some goal setting on what you think you should be able to get for soybeans, either some old crop that you might still have hanging around or more importantly, the crop that you're going to plant in about four months, the trick would be, you know, you want to set your targets at just that hair lower uh, than where we were last year. If your expectations is for prices that are higher than you got last year, in fact, if you're a bit of an optimist, I would suggest what you're really trying to do is hit the same prices as you had last year, and all we got to do is do a little better, right? This is um, the wheat market. Oh, one other thing I should mention. Um, in terms of soybeans, when our when the world supplies get a little bit bigger, and when uh, 
you know, prices for a variety of reasons aren't as high as they were a year ago. If you're the kind of guy that can grow food grade soybeans, the IP type soybeans, that's something I would really suggest you take a look at, right? If, if growing Roundup Ready crushers soybeans is easy and cheap, that's great. But I, would, I think that some people have walked away from that in the past, and I think this is the kind of year that we maybe need to go back and look at that again, plug those numbers into a crop budget, see what it looks like, because that's another way of getting a little bit more than what the marketplace wants to give you for that kind of stuff. So on to wheat. This is the Ontario uh, wheat business. Uh, we grow between 700,000 and a million acres of wheat in Ontario every year. Last fall, last October, you guys planted about 800,000 acres of wheat. It's almost all soft red now. We used to grow this real colorful mix of soft white and hard red winter and soft red, but we're narrowing into that. Milling capacity in Ontario, the flour milling capacity for soft red wheat is about 560,000 metric tons. So we produce about a little over 2 million tons of wheat, and we only need about 560,000. So there is surplus wheat in the Ontario marketplace. Now, the good news is we send about 400,000 tons of wheat to flour mills in the United States, so to Toledo and the mills in Michigan. And we also export about 300,000 tons of wheat that leaves the country. Most recently in the last year, Ontario has sent a pile of soft red wheat to Mexico. Anybody wonder why? It's really kind of cool when you look at a map, right? Because most of the U.S. soft red wheat crop is a lot closer to Mexico than, say, Elmwood. <laughs> but nobody in Bruce County is suggesting that the Mexicans pay for a wall. And so they're much happier to take your wheat. <laughs> it's mighty gracious of you. I don't know if we need a wall, actually. Maybe a fence around Desboro, they're sketchy, but outside of that. <laughs> just keep them in, the rest of us will be fine. Eh? And that's really a Gray County issue anyway. So here's some, I just want to put this up just for a sec, just to break it down. This is the last USDA report talking about wheat. And if you look at wheat production, over the last quarter century, wheat acreage has been dropping as soybean acreage goes up. But it looks like wheat stocks are actually getting tighter. And so I exploded out the last USDA report. So this is the December report. And what we want to do is break it out. Wheat is actually five completely different crops that they mush all together in one big ball. So you have hard red winter wheat, hard red spring wheat, soft red winter wheat, white wheat, and durum wheat. And they all market differently. Hard red winter wheat is actually shrinking in supply. Um, it's primarily growing in the U.S. Southwest, Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma. They had some bad times last winter. They're having a really bad time of it this winter. Stocks are going to go from about 589 down to 487 million bushels, sorry, tons. So they're going to drop the supply by about 25%. So there's going to be about 25% less hard red winter. The hard red springs, if you remember last summer, and they're still dealing with it, it got extremely dry in the high plains, in southern Saskatchewan, southern Alberta, Montana, um, Nebraska, the Dakotas, big drought. And spring wheat stocks are about half, well, not quite half, two-thirds of what they were, gone from 235,000 uh, down to 167. Soft red is up. There's more soft red than there was. Tends to be growing in the Great Lakes Basin, the Mississippi River Valley. Um, yields are pretty good, so wheat or uh, soft red wheat is up about 10%. White wheat is down a lot, mostly because we all got fed up and quit growing it. And Durham is down well about uh, stocks of Durham wheat are down about a third. And so what you get is sometimes we'll have. You know, we look at the wheat market and we say, oh, wheat is getting a little bit tight. Maybe this wheat market is going to turn around. Well, some parts of the wheat business, the hard reds for sure are tight. The soft ones really aren't. And you need to be able to differentiate and you need to be able to hit the opportunities that come up. And, and you'll know their opportunities when you understand the fundamentals of it. Who remembers what happened in the wheat market around Canada Day last year, right? Anybody sell any $7 a bushel wheat? 
Yeah, I was going to say, a bunch of people did, right? Some people sold two crop years worth of $7 wheat. It was fun, right? And what happened was they got worried about that dry weather in the U.S. high plains and the impact that that would have on hard red wheat stocks. And everybody's heard of the funds, right? The fund money in Chicago. They just started buying futures. And they bought Chicago wheat futures, which is soft red wheat. And so they came running in and bought a whole lot. It's like if some guy with a big dairy barn had a barn fire, and I thought, wow, he's going to need to buy cows. I should buy up all the Herefords, right? <laughs> so the funds came racing in, and they took, so like the Chicago wheat contract is soft red. They took it up by more than a dollar a bushel in a week, right? It was awesome. And then somebody said to them, um, buddy, wrong stuff, right? And... <laughs> And that's what happened. It was a big swing up and a hard breakdown within a very short period of time. The guys who understood that soft red wheat isn't scarce saw that move and thought, aha, right? This is it. This is our moment, right? Because there was really no reason for soft to go on that run. Now, it falls under the important trading principle of it is morally wrong to let a sucker keep his money, right? <laughs> so you guys all understand that when the funds do something silly, you take their cash, right? They're pros. If they lose, they lose. That's their problem, right? But that's, uh, that was that situation. And now you'll see spring wheats, the, the Kansas City is, and Minneapolis futures have stayed up. The soft wheat market got a little bit flat. So keeping an eye on, on being able to differentiate the things gives us a good idea of where to go. This is what the wheat market looks like if you drew a picture of it. So the top half of the screen is the, is the futures market. This is what we call a, a carry market. And then I put it on a, like a, a little picture drawing because, well, I'm dumb like that and I like pictures. I don't like reading words. Pictures are better. This is, um, this is what, it, what it would look like on a chart. So you have the nearby at like 420 and so on going up. You'll hit a flat point in the futures market. So if you're looking at the wheat futures today, um, next March, so we're trading March right now and it's about 425, but if you go to March of, of 8... March of 19. Holy crap, we're getting old. Ralph, we're getting old. Hey, the uh, 19 is, uh, is about 518, so it's about 85 cents a bushel higher. What you're looking for as a seller is where it levels out. So March, May, and July of next year are, are where the market levels out. That's kind of the real price of what this stuff is worth. And again, just like corn, where the better prices were early on and then it drops down as you come into delivery, what you're looking for in terms of trying to make sales is out there in that flat spot. Now, maybe today's not exactly the right day to sell wheat. Maybe we get a little bit of a winter kill rally here as we get into February, March, and they're sure the Ohio crop is under ice, and we can scare those funds into buying Herefords again or whatever. We get them up, but that's the spot where you want to do your marketing. The futures market operates like an escalator, and if you were standing in a shopping mall, that nearby escalator, the, the March at some point is going to go off the board, it drops through the floor, and then the May moves down to whatever price level the March was at, right? The whole thing just kicks down. And so the trick you want to be doing with wheat is selling it 6 to 18 months in advance, right? Get out into the flat part of the futures out there and don't participate in the decline. There's two reasons for that. The first is because, well, first of all, there's big carries out there, and it's kind of wrong not to take it. And the second reason is this. When we go back to the supply and the usage of wheat, somewhere between 300 and 800,000 tons of Ontario's wheat crop gets used for livestock feed, right? Two years ago when we had a really big wheat crop, it was about 850, but we very rarely use more wheat for flour than we use for feed. And feed mills tend to buy in the spot market, right? You, if you phoned up sure gain and said, hey, what do you give me for wheat in uh, April of 2019? They probably don't have a number, right? That's not the business they're in. They buy stuff that they're going to grind fairly soon. And that nearby market is priced relative to corn, okay? Because that's where it fits into livestock feed. So if you want to sell your wheat as wheat, you want to sell it way out on that, that further out period because when you get down, especially in a period of oversupply like this, um, you know, you're kind of slogging it out to see who can be cheapest there in the spot market. And that doesn't make you the most money for your farm business. Just for the sake of being appropriate. That's 
what a futures inverse looks like. So when the market is seriously low on stuff, um, you will get a situation where the nearby futures are the highest because they need it now. The last time we had an inverse in anything important was soybeans, and it was in 2014, right? So it only happens about once every six or eight years. It's, it's like, um, I was going to say it's as rare as the Toronto Maple Leafs winning the Stanley Cup. It's not quite that bad, but, you know, it, it's not all that likely. And so you can't, you can't bet the farm on that one. So look at those, at those big downfield moves. Again, just going back to world demand for grain, that's corn. Uh, wheat and soybeans, and you can see demand continues to grow in all of those crops. As we move the world population from 7 billion to 9 billion people, they're going to keep eating. And that, like I was saying in the first slide, is we've reached the point in the last year where we're now consuming more of the coarse grains, so corn, barley, rye, oats. Coarse grain consumption is exceeding the supply, and so we're looking at putting a, putting a bottom in there. So at this point, probably you're thinking, wow, Steve, you told us a lot of things about the grain market. Outside of wheat, we're actually grinding up a lot of stuff. What the heck is wrong with price? So here's what happened. I'll do the last three slides in the wrong order. This is the U.S. dollar. This is the United States greenback from January the 1st of 2017 to about the 10th of December. This one isn't right up to date because I had to send this to Southwest Ag. They wanted to print it. So... It's not right up to today, but that's what happened. Basically, this is the Trump administration with no Twitter. <laughs> so that's what an American dollar was worth on Inauguration Day. You can actually pick out all the important stuff. There's where he fired Comey. There's where they hired Mueller. There's where Flynn made a deal. You know, it isn't actually what it's about. All along, all through the campaign, the Americans were talking about balance of trade issues, right? Make America great again and stimulating the economy. They even talked about Chinese currency manipulation. Everybody remember those headlines? So the idea is that if you shrink down the size of the American dollar, it makes things made in the United States seem cheaper and it makes imports seem more expensive, right? So if you want to fix your balance of trade, sink your buck. Nobody can afford to buy stuff made somewhere else, right? And the things that you make and export to other parts of the world seem cheaper, and you'll superheat your economy. And so that's been a really deliberate strategy there for the last year. And for the most part, it's worked. For instance, the Dow Jones Industrial Average has gone from, I think, 21,000 up to about 23,000, right? So about a 15% gain in the stock market, but they're using 10% smaller dollars. So it's really only a 5% gain in the U.S. stock markets, they just use smaller dollars to count it. But it creates economic activity. You're eventually spinning the tires on the economy by doing this strategy. And so the Canadian dollar hasn't really been going up for the last year so much as the American dollar has been going down. And more importantly, you can get away with this in the U.S. because they really don't pay attention, right? In Canada, we're all kind of currency junkies, right? If we turned on CKNX radio in Wingham on the news, they'd tell us what the Canadian dollar is doing today, right? It's 80.26 if you're curious. But it's, you know, and not to speak ill of Wingham, but it's not exactly a major news media international outlet, right? It's not the, it's not the Wall Street Journal. We keep track of this stuff here in Canada. The average American, if we went and found a wheat grower in Kansas and said, hey, buddy, what's a dollar worth? What answer would we get? Dollar. It's worth a dollar, right? So in the land of Donald, you can make his dollar worth 90 cents, and he still thinks it's worth a dollar. right? Every American has taken a 10% pay cut in the last year, and they're completely ambivalent to it. Now, here's what that does to us as Canadian farmers. If you look at the price of soybeans today, I'm going to back that up one more. If you look at the price of soybeans today in Chicago, um, they're not radically different than they were a year ago. In the last 12 months, we've had the Canadian dollar as low as 72 cents, and now we're just a little bit above 80. But a typical price for soybeans might be about, in Chicago, say 10.05, the U.S. basis delivered to Hamilton's about 2,500. That's a pretty typical number. That would make soybeans worth 980 U.S. 
They're close to that today. If we had a 72 cent dollar, you take 980, divide it by 0.72, and soybeans would be worth 1361, right? So the basis in Ontario would be 356. If there's any ton guys here, that's $500 a ton for soybeans, right? And last January, the Canadian dollar was about 73 cents, 74 cents, and all kinds of guys were booking all kinds of new crop beans at 13 bucks. You take the Canadian dollar up to 80 cents, you see the left-hand side, the numbers didn't change, we're still at 980. You take 980 on an 80 cent dollar, we're down to 12.25, right? So we knocked a buck 40 a bushel out of the price of soybeans with the Canadian dollar moving eight cents. So, and there's two things to know about that. One is that that's not exactly proportional. Moving the dollar, eight, an 80 cent dollar, eight cents is a 10% move in the dollar. It's a 13% move in the price of soybeans, right? So the bigger the dollar gets, it's not a one-to-one -one trade off. And the second thing is that this applies to all crops. So we're about 50 cents a bushel lighter than we should be on corn, about 60 cents a bushel lighter than we should be on wheat, and about a buck 20 a bushel lighter on soybeans than we should be because of the American dollar situation. And I'm not sure we can fix that. I do think at some point the Americans have got to start to try and raise their, or stop the currency skid. They're going to get into inflation. They raised interest rates in early December. That's the first time in a year that they've done that. And they got their new tax reform bill passed. So it's possible that you're going to start to see them get some traction here. They probably should figure out that they need to get their dollar up before the average American voter figures out that his 401k is now only worth 360, right? There'll be a political cost to that when they learn math. So early on this year, the Bank of Canada was talking, or early on in 2017, the Bank of Canada was talking about the Canadian dollar sitting at around 74. And I don't know if we get all the way back down there, but it would be nice to push it back down. When it goes back down is when all of us need to get really, really, really busy about selling grain, right? Because it has a huge impact on price. And depending on how the American economy fares with a bigger dollar, they may try this again, right? If they get kind of hooked on this, it could get jumpy. So as we move the dollar lower, regardless of what the futures market is doing, it's probably a good idea to hop on, um, hop on making some sales because it's a big, big difference. Other than that, I think last year's prices are all, for the most part, achievable. Um, in this year's market. It's just going to be that we'll get much shorter windows to hit it in. As supplies get bigger, those spikes are shorter. Um, and so you need to, be, need to be a little bit trigger happy. I was saying to a group of farmers the other day that, you know, the best time to shoot groundhogs is when they're out of the ground, right? <laughs> yep, five. So um, it's the same thing with grain prices. When we get that June rally, do not wait to August to try and hit it, right? And the second thing is everybody should always know exactly what price they want to sell stuff for, right? Because you got all kinds of time in January and February to figure it out. And if you don't know what you want, you won't know when you got it, right? Um, setting pricing orders is a good strategy, some of those kinds of things. So I got the nod that I got, we got about five minutes. So does anybody have any questions that we should address? Stephen, could you uh, do a little bit of comment on the implications of any change in NAFTA and the, and the resulting grain trade right here? Yeah. So, first of all, I'm actually a big fan of the idea that the NAFTA discussion gets shaky because that might push the Canadian dollar down, right? It's like, I don't, you know, I don't really like driving fast, but it's cool when you get there quick. Um, <laughs> We need something to make this market a little bit turbulent and weakening the Canadian dollar wouldn't hurt. The NAFTA agreement, if I understand it correctly, is that if the, the current agreement is Canada, the US and Mexico, and it says in that agreement that if it fails, we go back to the old 1984 Brian Mulroney, Ronald Reagan free trade deal between Canada and the United States. So it takes getting rid of two deals before we don't have a free trade deal with the Americans. Um, However, having said that, there's a, a fella in Washington who thumb types a lot in the morning um, who has said he thinks it's a terrible deal and he wants to get out of it. And it'll be interesting to see, but um, I would suspect that we finish up pretty close 
Um, agriculturally, we have essentially free trade now, with the exception of the supply managed commodities. There's all kinds of stuff moving both ways over the border, so it shouldn't mess it up for, for grain producers substantially at all, um, either way. Um, and, uh, but yeah, if our best hope in getting the dollar to drop hard and fast would be if, uh, you know, we could shake that up a little for a few days. Hi, Stephen. Uh, just wondering what you're thinking is going to happen here on Friday with the USDA report coming out. So the surest way to make sure you're wrong is to say something, which... <laughs> hey, Brendan, who's going to win the Leafs game tonight, right? It's a 50-50. The, um, there's a couple things that we know need to happen with the USDA reports. One of them I alluded to earlier, they have to take their soybean export number down. Okay, because they're lying about it. It's not as big as they think it is. That's going to mess up the soybean market a little bit. Second thing um, that in terms of when we first get into planting intentions and what the size of the 18 crop looks like is that American farmers haven't made a whole pile of money in the last couple of years. And with a lower dollar, inputs cost more. So it would be nice to see if they could shave corn acreage a bit. The early numbers... That December report, which I had a couple slides from, suggested that American corn acreage was going to actually go up a little bit, up to about 91 million acres from 90 in 2017. And I'd like to imagine that that's not actually how it's going to go down. That, uh, you know, the cheaper crop, the one that takes the least amount of money to get into the ground, is not corn. So if we can get corn acreage down, that would be useful. Um, for the corn market, it would be bad for whatever crop those acres drift into, but I think that's probably likely too. Slightly bigger soybean crop in 18, slightly smaller corn crop. Just throw it. <laughs> Short question. You always talked about the possibility of the dollar going down. What are the chances that it might go the opposite way? What traders told me about a couple yep. of months ago that we could see an 85. Yeah. It depends on how successful the Americans think they're going to be by shrinking their dollar, right? Um, and right now, I think they're kind of hooked on it, right? A few weeks ago, and I don't mind admitting I was wrong on this one, when they raised interest rates a half a point, no, quarter point, U.S. Federal Reserve had the first interest rate raise of the year, and then it was two or three days later they passed the tax bill. And I thought, okay, that's it. Now the American dollar is going to start to go up, and the Canadian dollar is going to start to go down. The next nine consecutive days in a row after they did that, the American dollar continued to fall, which kind of lies outside of logic, or it was really going to fall if they hadn't, right? Um, so it depends. But at some point, if they push their dollar down hard enough, fast enough, they're going to have some inflation. And right now, they have a population that seems largely unaware that this is the strategy they've been using to heat up the economy. And I think they'd probably prefer, especially with midterm elections coming this fall, to, to try and smooth it out a little bit, right? If the discussion in, you know, if gasoline suddenly costs the average American five bucks a gallon in September, he's voting different than he did the last time, right? He's just mad and this ain't good, right? Um, so they're going to need to, I think they're going to need to get the brakes on this. To move your currency 10% in a year is a long way. There's no proof of that, right? If they, if they decide this is working great and it's all green grass and sunshine, they could keep going. But um, there's no fundamental reason under the Canadian dollar why it's as good as it is. And that's the other piece of this, right? We're really, you know, we had a good jobs number, but not a really good jobs number last week. There was a loss in full-time jobs and an increase in part-time work. Somehow or another, we thought that was good. <laughs> so, yep. All right. 